with a special reference to Sanskrit philology. Today, Indology is often replaced by Indian studies, which has much broader meaning and includes as well Indian history and languages, social and anthropological studies of Indian cultures. Denmark in general and the University of Copenhagen in particular have a long and distinguished history of Indology. The story begins as an often overlooked chapter in the history of Denmark's colonial period in the 17th century. In, 18, uh, sorry, in 1620, the explorer Uwe Gida reached the east coast of India and established a colony at a place he called Trankabar, which is modern Tarangambadi, located on the coast of the Indian state of Tamil Nadu, about 150 kilometers south of the modern city of Chennai. From 1620 to 1850, when it was taken over by the British, Trankabar served as a center of Danish activity in India. In 1755, I.C. Sotman established a satellite colony called Sirampur near Calcutta in Bengal which also was eventually transferred to the British in 1845. A third and rather insignificant colony was founded in 1784 on the Nicobar Islands, just south of the Andamans in the Indian Ocean. It too was transferred to the British in the middle of the 19th century. Like, most, like those of most of the other colonial powers in India, Danish efforts centered in trade and missionary work, with the exception of the British who focused primarily on trade. In order to convert the indigenous Indians to Christianity, missionaries devoted a good deal of their time to learning regional languages and to translating the Bible's New Testament and parts of the Old Testament into those languages. This, of course, opened up an entirely new world to those educated European priests who were sent abroad. They began to describe different languages and develop pedagogic tools in the form of grammars and dictionaries. One of the first priests ordained in the newly established Danish Evangelical Lutheran Mission among the Hindus was Bartholomeus Zygabout. He learned Portuguese and Tamil and published a Tamil grammar in Latin in 1716, which was one of the first Western language grammars in an Indian Dravidian language. Based on only 119 Tamil texts in his possession, Zagenbelt wrote the Bibliotheca Malabarica, which published, which published in 1708 was the first European contribution to the history of Tamil literature. A few further contributions to South Indian languages and cultures followed from later missionaries, but it was not until Karsten Niebuhr visited India on his return from Yemen that Danish contributions to the study of India became, came into the mainstream of continental Indology. Beginning in September 1763, Niebuhr spent 14 months on the western coast of India, recovering from a case of fever he developed on the way from the Middle East. He stayed with the British in Bombay, but as he regained his strength, he ventured out along the coast, reaching as far as Surat on the river Tepti near the Bay of Kampe in the modern state of Gujarat. Unlike the South Indian Dravidian culture in language around Trankabar, Bombay in modern Maharashtra and Surat in Gujarat are dominated by speakers of North Indian languages, of which Sanskrit is the oldest known example. In the 18th century, the discipline of Oriental studies was established in European universities, beginning with Sir William Jones, 
widely received description of the similarities between Sanskrit, Persian, and Greek, the interest in Sanskrit began to grow, with German comparative philology leading the way. A Danish student of this school of thought was Rasmus Rask, who distinguished himself as one of the leading scholars in the field of his studies of of these studies of Nordic and Icelandic languages and mythologies. Rask immediately understood the importance of Sanskrit after hearing the words of Rasmus Nirup, who as professor of history and literature gave lectures on Indian literature and mythology at the University of Copenhagen. He said that he inspired Rask to study ma and master Sanskrit with the words there is not yet known what there stands in the Edda, the Nor Nordic Edda literature. One needs to study Sanskrit in order to understand what's found in the Eddic literature. Given inspiration in this way, from 1820 to 1823, Rasmus Ras traveled to India and Ceylon and returned with many handwritten original works that would become crucial for the development of Indian philology in Denmark. He began his linguistic explorations in Bombay on the 29th of September, 1820, and following in the footsteps of Niebuhr, sailed up to Surat. From there, he traveled by boat on rivers and by foot overland to Sirampur before sailing south to Trankabar. Like Niebuhr before him, Rask took copious notes on aspects of people's, the people's language and customs. He spent time in Madras recuperating from illness before reaching the by now former Danish colony of Trankabar in South India. In October 1821, he sailed on to Ceylon, modern Sri Lanka, where he lived most of the time in the capital city, Colombo and devoted his time to learning Pali and Sinhala. The first is the language of the Theravada scriptures, known as the Pali Canon, and the second is the indigenous language of the island kingdom. Both find their roots in Sanskrit. He acquired many palm leaf manuscripts written in Pali language, and these would eventually form the basis of the editions of several books of the Pali Canon he distinguished himself in Sanskrit lexicography and in the deciphering of ancient Indian inscriptions, which he collected during the three-year expedition to India from 1841 to 1844. He produced several students whose contributions provided different shades to the picture of Indian Indology. The most well-known among them was Søren Sørensen, who is recognized for his pioneering studies of the Indian epic Mahabharata and for his still useful index to the names in the Mahabharata. The shift from Sanskrit to Middle Indic in Pali studies began with the point, appointment of Mikkel Vigo Fusbol to succeed Westergaard in 1878. He studied Sanskrit at the university uh, which prepared him for the task of taking on the manuscripts correct, collected by Rasmus Rask and brought back to the university. He studied these handwritten documents with extreme skill and diligence and developed a system for transcribing into Roman letters the Sinhala alphabet in which Pali scriptures were written. This system, <coughs> for the most part, is still used for the publication of Pali texts and for the use of Pali words in scholarly articles and papers. His opus magnum was the six volume edition of the birth stories of the Buddha, known as the Jataka stories, which, be, which was begun in 1873 and completed with an index volume prepared by his student, Danis Anderson, in 1897. His editions of the stories has served as the basis for numerous translations of the stories of the Buddha in a former life. And as a reference text,
for establishing the, the connections between these stories and the fables of Aesop, the stories of the 1001 Arabian Nights, and the later children's literature of the Panchatantra and Hitopadesha. It was probably this, his collection of stories from this Indian didactic literature that prompted Christian H. Kalkar, a respectable theologian from Calcutta, on his visit to Copenhagen to report to Hans Christian Andersen, the famous author of the fairy tales, that the master storyteller was soon to receive a copy of his fairy tales translated into Sanskrit. Upon receiving this information, Anderson became thoroughly delighted. Unfortunately, it was a mistake because the theologian was referring to the Hittopadesha, and to my knowledge, there is not one translation of Hans Christian Andersen's fairy tales in Sanskrit, and almost every other language in the world, but not in Sanskrit. In the later part of his academic career, Falspall had a very bright co-worker named Dennis Anderson, who was, an who was instrumental in making Pali part of the curricula of most Indology programs in Europe and abroad by publishing his Reader and Glossary of Pali in 1907. It is still used as the principal to tool for teaching Pali language. After receiving his degree of doctor grad from the University of Copenhagen in 1892, Anderson was employed at the university library and eventually was put in charge of the Pali manuscripts to which he devoted most of his entire scholarly efforts. He succeeded Fußball as professor of Indology in 1903 and served as the principal authority for numerous projects that dealt with India and Buddhism until his retirement in 1920, uh, 1928. His pedagogical material and critical essays on Pali and the lit uh, Pali language and literature paved the way for the critical Pali dictionary, which some consider to be the most significant Danish contribution to Indological scholarship. The critical Pali dictionary owes its origin to the work of Wilhelm Trankner, a fairly well-off school teacher who, after learning Persian and Arabic, undertook the study of Pali manuscripts in the Rasmus Rast collection. Thanks to these pioneering efforts of Trankner to describe each word of the Pali canon, the groundwork was laying for Danis Anderson and Helmer Smith professor of Sanskrit and comparative linguistics at the University of Uppsala in Sweden to start the Critical Pali Dictionary under the sponsorship of the Danish Royal Academy of Sciences in 1924. After completing a total of 36 fa fascicles published in three volumes covering the letter K, K the project has sadly come to an end. However, the original work and materials collected by Trankner are currently housed in the Danish Royal Library in Copenhagen, awaiting an ambitious scholar once again to pick up the project and complete the dictionary. A new phase of Indology in Denmark began, began with one of the most versatile Danish scholars of India, Paul Tuxen, the son of a classicist, Søren Ludwig Tuxen. Tuxen was an accomplished violinist who studied with Dinas Andersen and the German Indologist Ernst Windisch in Leipzig. He received a doctor grad from the University of Copenhagen in 1911. Moving easily in many genres of Sanskrit literature and through several of the ancient Indian languages, he prepared many translations into Danish and wrote extensively on Sanskrit and Indian culture for both the scholar and for the general reader. More than any other Danish Indologist before him or after him, Tuxen made Indian culture and language and thought accessible to the Danish people. 
He was named the Professor of Indology in 1928 to succeed Danis Anderson. And what's interesting, uh, one of the uh, obligations we have as a Danish academic, as a Danish teacher in the university, is what they call formidling. I don't know if they have that also in Norway. But it is something that we're obligated to present our research to the general public. We don't, not only to scholars, but we have to tell the general public what we're doing, which is a very interesting uh, endeavor because when you're embraced in these kinds of technical linguistic studies, to bring that up and to explain to the general public what you're doing becomes a rather challenging task. So continuing Indology uh, in Denmark, Han Hans Hendriksen succeeded Tuxen as professor in 1951 and shifted the emphasis from philology to linguistics. His interest in li linguistics are few university programs in Europe and North America to offer Sanskrit in Indology to see students seeking a BA and an MA degree. Uh, I'll conclude with these final comments here. Through the long history of Indology in Denmark, one aspect has remained constant, the emphasis on superior teaching and research in classical languages and cultures of India. While programs in Indology in Indian studies are rapidly disappearing from the curricula of Western universities, it continues, for the time being, to be recognized as an important and a degree-granting discipline at the University of Copenhagen. And I would say, just as a final remark, that if this program and this institution of this Distinguished Indology Award has any value whatsoever, I would say it would be to try to preserve the study of Indology and Sanskrit studies, both in India and especially abroad, because these programs are in serious danger of disappearing. I mean, it's fun, it's great to have a gathering and to celebrate Indology, but we also must look to the future of Indology and to see indeed that it does remain as a strong discipline in the universities where it's still maintained. In Germany, the number of, of uh, Indology chairs has diminished by more than half. And in these countries, other countries of Europe and North America, they're going very, very fast. In an economic world, Indology is not a high priority. So I think it should be our obligation to try to maintain this as a serious discipline in the universities around the world. Thank you. Would you like to ask a question? Sorry? Would you like to ask a question? Yes, fine. Yeah. Any questions from the floor? <laughs> no question, no? No question. Huh? Yeah, please. Our country used to be called Indian subcontinent. Now it is called so part of Southeast Asia, South Asia. So Indology studies may disappear and in their place, something like South Asian studies may come up. It is a non-descript word, overturning the use of the word India itself. Yeah. In Germany, you said the Sanskrit studies had gone by half. Maybe they will get replaced by South Asian studies. No, uh, no, not, no, not at all. In fact, South Asian studies probably is something that is uh, a detriment to Indological studies because South Asian studies tends to s emphasize anthropology and social sciences, not so much language and literature and Sanskrit studies. So I would prefer that we maintain the old tradition of Indology or Indian studies or something that highlights the, the aspect that we're dealing with traditional culture 
and languages, especially Sanskrit and Middle Indic and uh, even Hindi. That's fine. Can we go to the next speaker? Yeah. <coughs> Alvarez to make his presentation. Where is he? Yeah, please. Thank you. Uh, because the time is very short, I will be no presentation, nothing, not, no introduction. I just read my paper and explain. Last Friday, 13 of this month, it caused me a great impression seeing by the TV those French citizens walking through the tunnels, exiting from that stadium, singing the Marseillaise. They seemed choked, but no afraid. They sang as a column of Galois, in French, under attack, but never defeated. They walked together as they have done through the history. That was an extremely virile reaction of a great people who know how to overcome destructive, destructive action, who, who wants unleashing the house everywhere. In Sanskrit, the root bid contained the linguistic strain which perceive and understand what means paralyzing fear, terror. All words derived from bid express destructive concepts, pravidiam, vidyam, etc. These words capture realities such as breaking, destroying, dispersion. In the Mahabharata, Lord Krishna explained to Arjuna how to resist the blows of an enemy and he uses the word vivishadi, meaning resist brokenness, no break, no disperse, always keep the union. In the Arthachastra, it's very common the concept vina, means violence, destruction of what is harmonic. The evilness, the destructive being, the spirit of evil, seek the destruction and disunity. By opposition, yoga is the union with the supreme being. The evil wants to spread fear that paralyzes and disrupts. That is the destructive action that is present in the material world and is against to the flow of life. It is the disorder and disturbance. Because life is organization, when it weakens or alters, begin the corruption, the decay, the disintegration, and finally come the death. We saw a few days ago in Paris, but also happened in my place, in Santiago of Chile, effective minorities who manage to alter what has cost so much to wield, the incendiary, the incendiary action that causes disturbance, discomposition, and that wants to break the rules, the empire of law, the constitutional order. Many thousand years ago have passed, sorry, many thousand years have passed, and the council of Lord Krishna is perfectly current. Never show fear, nor flee, nor disperse. Nevertheless, keep, but nevertheless, keep the union and the integrity. And I think very humanly, the value of the integrity is the value of India and her legacy for the world. Today, there is mind dispersing. Many analyzers, many of them among the smartest, say that the policies, the economics, and the legal structure have been twisted until turning towards the incoherency. I think it's the time for the Sanskrit studies. And I agree with my colleague, but I think it's not so bad. A new time for the Vedas is coming. The world needs a Vedic solution in the level of the mind. This is why I will give my testimony how we in a very far country, even a very small country, we are only 17 million people, we are trying to build a new order or a new country or a new era, if you like, same other uh, American uh, cities, cities with the appearance of a divine revelation looking like a Moses coming down from Sinai mountain to bring the truth to his people. 
As a result of this new epoch is born the Chilean Orientalism, which can be dated around the end of the 19th century. Those first studies circles moved between metaphysical reading, occultism, theosophy, plus, plus some wings with the free mansory. The first one local oriental school was the Sudha Dharma Mandalam, philosophical religious organization that started its activities in the year 19, 1927. And I'm very proud to say I have teach uh, Sanskrit in that uh, uh, Sudha Dharma Mandalam today. Uh, this school was linked to the line of master of South of India, and it's part of international network which still exists. On the other hand, during the first two dec decades of the 20th century, comes to Chile a wave of immigrants from different countries of Europe and from the Near East, bringing a wide of variety of new knowledge, some of them with a high level of instruction varied philosophical and religious sensibilities. This social process happens in parallel with the Prussianization of the military schools in my country, which under the influence of its prestige and educational outcomes inside, extend the preference by German professor and master who start to teach in Chilean university and the, in the schools of arts and crafts, academies, and forming a school for basic educational teachers. The rigor of Germanic style is mixed in those days with a wide range of new and exquisite disciplines. I belong to the University of Chile. It's the eldest university in my country. In that university, University of Chile, among other new studies, Good gain a place the philology, the linguistic, the comparative religion studies, and begins teachings on Latin and Greek. A similar and parallel process happened in both Catholic University there are in Chile until today, Santiago Catholic University and Valparaiso Catholic University. Spaniard or Greeks immigrant initiated to teaching in those university their ancestral languages. A special mention must be done about the first Sanskrit course offered at the Pedagogical Institute of the University of Chile by a professor who was coming from Germany. Under his teachings, a bunch of future great academicians learned to write the Vanagari. They will be those who opened the first furrows where the seed of Asian studies and ideology will be. After the Second World War, happens in Chile the institu institutionalization of the previous trend. Also with, the, with more immigrant people, the type of people who was very mixed now, but was very frequent to see respected professional trying to start in Chile a new life. Some of them were related to humanities and also to higher education. Also by the development of, of what already was going, consequently was created in the University of Chile, several academical centers as the Greek and the Byzantine study center, the Jewish study center, the Arab study center, and I hope I will be creating, still is no, the Indological center. It's waiting for some push more. Um, who is reading this document started his study in the cradle of the Catholic University of Valparaiso. Initially, I took my first steps in the high academic research as an assistant of the prestigious professor Hector Herrera, Byzantinist, who launched me into classical studies and explained it to me the importance of having proficiency in ancient languages. In this 